Hi, we're going to start, right? Sounds great. Thank you. This is a great show. I have never been here be to this show before. It's fantastic. It's amazing. It's such an interesting intersection of artists working in a huge array of mediums. It makes you want to shop. So I'm looking forward to shopping. <laughs> but thank you for coming out to see us today. I'm really excited to hear what Ashley has to tell us because I expect to learn a lot from her. I know very little about how to get into the um, world of emerging Canadian artists, and I'm, I'm really interested in that. But I want to tell you a little bit about Ashley. Ashley founded Ninth Editions, which is an online gallery that you should check out. Her gallery sells limited edition prints and original works, and she's really interested in bringing um, young, contemporary, emerging artists to your attention and helping you become engaged in their work. And she's also the curator for the Drake, Drake Hotel Properties, and she advises on public art projects across Canada. So she's very knowledgeable. So quickly, I know we're going to get into our slides and learn about how to collect. We're calling this Collecting 101. And I'm going to speak at the end about how to choose the right art for your rooms, which is a total no-no as far as art connoisseurs are concerned. But let's face it, if it doesn't look great in, with your room, you're not going to be very interested in having it in your home. Tell us how you started in this, and a little bit about you. I studied art history growing up. I attended the National Ballet School of Canada, and it was part of our curriculum. So I have only ever known a world where I was studying art history, and I think it's always been a passion and an interest. And then over sort of the course of my career, I ended up doing a master's in art business, so I could pair my love of art history all the way up into contemporary art with sort of a business understanding of how to support the arts while operating in this sort of very complex world. But again, from a business perspective, I got into curating very naturally, just sort of doing pop-up shows with friends who were artists and other curators. And then I ended up landing the job at the Drake, which is where I was really sort of immersed in curating um, dozens of shows a year at different properties, sort of specific to different spaces. And I was always working with emerging artists who I saw didn't have representation yet. And then I also had a lot of friends who were asking me where to find artwork at affordable prices from emerging artists. So I decided to create a platform to connect the two. And it's been such a joy to be able to share the work of these hugely talented artists, you know, 12 months a year, because you don't always have the joy of having the artist project every weekend. Um, and then, yeah, supporting them between their different exhibi exhibitions and moving them to the next stage of their career. Great. And I'm old enough to be a mother, and I'm uh, the founder of House and Home magazine and Maison and Demer, and I've had a TV show for 10 years on all the networks, and now I do House and Home TV on for us on, on, on um, houseandhome.com and on our YouTube channel. We hope you'll follow us. Let's just get the promo out of the way. Yes. What's your um, Instagram? At Ninth Editions. That's it. But Ninth spelled out N-I-N-T-H. And mine's Linda Reeves Design with a Y. Linda Reeves Design. Please follow us. Okay, that's the end of the promotional part. So when I started, up, you, there was nothing like this. We didn't know what emerging artists were. You had to save your money until you could afford to get a Jack Bush or a Pierre Houdoff, who were a st sort of established by then, but they were still relatively affordable. But we didn't know anything about emerging artists and nothing about contemporary art. And we used to buy posters until we could afford real art. So you are so lucky to have this opportunity. So give us some tips on how to get into it. Okay, and go ahead and move your yes. images. There are really two avenues. There's so many different ways that you can collect, but there are really two avenues that people tend to uh, follow. There's working with an art advisor or digging in, doing the legwork and collecting yourself sort of based on your own process. And so art advisory is a growing profession right now because a lot of people are busy uh, and there are so many valued benefits to it. How much does it cost to have an art advisor? There is no entry level cost depending who you're working with. There are a few different uh, models that art advisors follow. So you can either um, find one that does an hourly rate and there's no entry level price on art that they'll find for you depending who it is of course. And then there are people that take a percentage of the value of the art. Okay. 
And so an art advisor's value really comes from them helping you navigate the complex world of art. They can provide um, insight and sort of education around it, as well as um, a value in terms of the relationships they have with the galleries. So an art advisor might have first access to the best works because they've worked with that gallery before, or they'll get a discount at that gallery. And so if they're charging you, say, 10% on the value of the artwork, and they've received a 15% discount from the gallery, then you're actually saving money. So there's a huge value oh, they to they pass it. on the discount. They pass on the discount. Okay, good. Yes. Good. You always, of course, want to work with an art advisor that is really transparent. And most, I say, um, believe are, uh, because it is sort of a tricky world. But they have huge insight. And they can help you develop a really cohesive um, collection, all working within your own financial parameters. So there's huge benefits to that. But also, as someone who loves contemporary art and working with artists, I really love the other model. And so I use this photo of Herb and Dorothy Vogel um, to sort of signify um, what can happen when you really love art. They uh, were a couple living in New York City in the mid uh, 20th century. He was a postal worker, she was a librarian, and they amassed one of the most significant art collections of post 1960s art in the world. And so they embedded themselves in the art community, they met artists, they did studio visits. They sort of participated really wholeheartedly, and on their salaries, they could collect si significant work very early because they were sort of embedded in the community. So I love this story because it's sort of my dream of you know working with all of these emerging artists and being able to help them build their career to the next stage. They also have a documentary on them that I highly recommend everybody see. Yeah, it's inspiring. Really good. What's it called? Um, Urban Dorothy Vogel. Okay. The Vogels. Yes, OK. So there are many different um, avenues to pursue. But as a curator for public artworks, as well as my own collection, I sort of operate within this curatorial philosophy. And it's different for everyone, but I think the more tools you have in your toolbox, the better. Um, for me, it's really important that they identify as an artist with a capital A. I want them to be sort of committed. And again, this is something that I have to clarify because I work with very emerging artists. But I think it's something that's sort of perfectly represented with the artist project. These are all artists that have put themselves out there. They've committed to their practice. They're engaging with um, their collectors or possible like art lovers. And I think that that's really admirable. And I think that helps sort of build their career and the momentum. And I want to see them um, doing something that's really unique. And so that ties into the first one, because artists who are really committed and identify as an artist as their profession are pushing their medium. They're collaborating with fellow artists. Um, they're really integrating themselves into the art world. Um, and of course, if you are buying from an established gallery, this has already all been sort of vetted for you. But if you are buying directly from an artist, um, I really find that this sort of helps guide my process. And then, of course, principles. And this is a very personal one, but I really believe that what an artist creates is sort of put into their work. And so I want to believe in what they create in terms of like philosophy. And this is not something that um, I come across often, but I want to really be able to speak to that person um, as an artist with their whole belief system. So by the time an established gallery has, is representing them, is it too late? No, I don't think so. I think there are so many different tiers of galleries. Okay. But I mean, if you're really starting out, like like buying your first piece that you think it might actually be a good investment, yes. can you do that directly with the artist? You can. I think so. Oh, good. How? I believe so. <laughs> <laughs> On to my next point. Um, so it's really about educating yourself. Yeah. And regardless of whether you go with an art advisor or do it on your own, it's education is first and foremost. And I think so many times when people are thinking about buying a piece of art, they think of it just as in terms of the transaction. And it really is that's just a fraction of the experience of buying artwork. I think there's so much that builds up before it. Right. And so if you want to find an art artist early on in their career that you love. It, it takes a lot of digging, but I always think that the rewards are... So like it's time. It's a commitment of time. Yes. 
I think we expect it to happen like that. I kind of, I kind of do. Exactly. But you're talking about it's like a hobby. It is. Like you have to get out there and use your free time yeah. to meet artists and explore shows and go to galleries and what else? Yes. So. Social media is probably the easiest tool to sort of start with because it allows you to be a, a passive participant of the art world and just looking, 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 looking. And, you know, I have two little kids. I spend so much time looking online right now, and I think that there's actually so much out there. And so my main tool, whether you have Instagram or not, but I think it's a hugely valuable resource. And so I've sort of just done a quick highlight of um, the types of accounts that I really like to follow. And so, of course, I put my own ninth editions, where you would see inspiration images, artworks, um, sort of events we're doing, um, and all the emerging artists that um, I'm, I'm really pushing behind. Um, MOCA, Museum of Contemporary Art, that's, of course, a contemporary art gallery here in Toronto. And this whole sort of selection is very Toronto-centric, but no matter where you are in the world, you can sort of tap into the different um, institutions and, and members. CBC Arts is a huge um, overview of what's happening in Canada in the arts. Mercer Union is an artist-run centre, and I think artist-run centres are not as widely known because they're sort of smaller galleries. They're all free. Um, they're artist-led, and so they don't really have the same scale of public funding, but they do really, really interesting programming. Um, Diana Ham, she's an art advisor who also does an amazing feature for her house and home where she highlights um, an artist each month. And it's a new column. A new column. Yeah. It's great. It's a fantastic column. And so she'll highlight artworks that she thinks are really interesting. So again, it's sort of that cross-section of highlighting artists that someone who's very trained and experienced and researched is pointing out. Um, Canadian Art Forecast is a really interesting one as well. It was started um, not too long ago and highlights all emerging artists. And so you can sort of see a huge collection of emerging artists from across Canada and see who the art community is sort of talking about and are working together. Um, Franz Kaka is a art gallery, again, sort of on the more emerging side. But I love sort of seeing what they're curating, what they're partnering with other sort of institutions doing. And then again, you can go straight to the artist. So Laura Daw, this is her account. And I, I love following artists. Again, my practice and my sort of interest is very, very artist-led. And so I think by being able to sort of see the secret world of artists' lives and their creation process and what drives them, you, you start to sort of build a familiarity with them. And then I think, you know, it's the easiest way to get in touch with them. You just send them a message, hey, I'm really interested in your work. And I think that if you're looking to invest and buy in emerging artists, then, then that's the easiest, simplest way. So exhibitions and events. Again, sort of still in the looking category, but something that um, you can do in a very easy way, especially if we're talking about this from a, a Toronto location. Um, just to go through, you know, a few of the options, there are so many that you can go to. Again, museums, many of them have hours that are free. So if you're sort of looking to see whether you want to, like, part actually go to the special exhibition or not, you can Google them and have easy access. There are so many museums in Toronto, whether it's the Textile Museum, the Batashu Museum, all of these intersecting sort of types of um, culture always add to the experience and I always say looking is the most valuable way to decipher what you like and again with Instagram you can save things into folders and it's really surprising sometimes when you look back and you start what to about see. Pinterest? Does Pinterest help? I think Pinterest, Pinterest, Pinterest is a great source for sort of seeing um, things in situ. Right. But I want to get to how we do it. How you I know all this. I want to get to how we how start you collecting. <laughs> it's looking. Okay, it's looking. <laughs> okay, it's looking, looking, looking. So again, it's always attending all of these spaces to see the really valuable um, uh, works, what institutions are doing. Um, exhibition openings, I think, are a great way, too, to sort of see who's attending everything. Workshops, you're working directly with the artists, so you get to know their medium and 
oftentimes I find people will buy things from the artist that they just did a workshop with. Artist Talks. Talking to an artist. Artist Talks is a good one. Artist Talks, I find sometimes there sort of feels like this distance between artists and a collector and I'm always encouraging people to bridge that by just reaching out, but artist talks are a great way to hear artists talk about their practice and have your questions answered without immediately approaching them. And again, the more you hear people talking about their their artwork, the more familiar, the familiar you are with the language right. and you feel more comfortable talking about it yourself. And I think that is one of the biggest barriers, at least that I've found people telling me about. And exhibition tours, collector dinners, patron circles. So you can join the AGO Young Patron Circle or different levels of patron circles and they'll curate events for you. They'll take you to private collections. They'll have dinners, talks. Um, I think they're a really valuable resource. And then online resources. Again, this is still <laughs> more research and I'm obviously heavily researched so I really believe in it. Um, this is an avenue that I think that not as many people know yeah. about. Yeah. And so Canadian banks all have really established and very skilled and knowledgeable curators. So they have some of the most um, respected collections. And of course, it's public. So you're never actually really going to get access. Not often. No, Sometimes but you can, you can ask to see it. You can ask, you can ask to see bank collections. And they are so tapped in. They know what's coming up. A lot of the banks also have their own dedicated art prize. So for example, RBC has their own dedicated painting prize. And so they are doing so much legwork to sort of see who the next um, most talented you know, artists are coming up. And then if you, this is an artwork by Rajni Pereira, and RBC owns this work. But then if you go and see what the Art Gallery of Ontario is collecting, they collected a work by Rajni Pereira last year at the art fair. So if you want to sort of understand who is operating at what level of the landscape, that's a really interesting way to sort of do your digging. And also being collected by a bank and a museum is obviously very prestigious. So while Rajni is still an emerging artist, she's sort of leveling up to the next stage in her career, and I think that's a great place to start collecting artists. So when you, too. when you find an artist you really like, one of the key questions is, are you in any collections already? Mm -hmm. And they'll have a bio, and they'll tell you if any of the banks have bought their work, or if they're in any major galleries, public galleries, that's a big thing. Big if thing. you're worried about your uh, sound investment, or whether anyone else is interested. Mm -hmm. um, and again, in terms of online resources, and of course, many of these come in publications, print publications, but you have the, the major Canadian publications, and then you have the international publications. So Artsy, for example, after every art fair, will do a roundup of trends they're seeing. And so that's always a nice way to sort of correlate that to what you're seeing in your own saved folders and see what sort of things are coming up, what, what's being talked about. And I think, again, if you, the more confidence you feel, with, the more intentionally you're going to buy, and then that creates a really um, sort of focused and thoughtful collection. And then, of course, we have House and Home. Oh, yes, we have House and Home. Well, that's what we're specializing in. Yes. Diana's column is about how is she's discovering young Canadian artists, and she's trying to show you the ones to watch. Exactly. So this was a for her most recent this month. feature, and I, I I love the way that it's all broken down. So you you learn about the artist, you learn about specific works that she highlights, and then she talks you through the process, their motivation, and actually coincidentally, um, Dill Hildebrand is a winner of the RBC painting competition. So you sort of see the pathways, yeah. and um, again, you see who is collecting his work, and then also what the starting price is. And I think that's also something that's really important because there's not always a ton of transparency around you know, pricing. She always tells the price of everybody. We won't yeah. publish it. No, we I mean, it's I love all that. about money. I'm sorry, but everybody wants to know. Yes. Yeah. And it is. It's, it's sort of this like chaotic marketplace in terms of understanding value. And yeah. so the more transparency there is around it, I think the more people understand it. And I think it should really be a very open conversation. So I like that a lot. Okay, so there are always trends in the market, and these are sort of things that I'm seeing that I, I think are really interesting. And again, 
their movements. Um, these are all Canadian artists. These are, these are the hot trends right now. These are the hot trends right now. So just sculptural like, frames. Sculptural frames. So Vanessa Maltese and Stephanie here were both um, RBC painting winners. Derek Liddington is, is collected by um, banks and um, museum institutions. But this sort of idea that the frame is becoming part of the artwork, so it's an extension of the artwork, and artists are taking really creative approaches to this, and it's something that I really um, am drawn to. It's a personal favorite. And I think it's valuable to see also what's happening in the trend so that you understand um, again, sort of like the movements and what to see, and I always want to see something that's really unique. Um, figurative painting. I love figurative. I'm so glad it's back. I'm, I, I am too. I think that there is value in abstraction because anyone can approach it with their own experience, but I love figurative painting, and I think that there's a lot of really um, interesting work that's coming yes, out of painting it. Painting specifically. Painting. So painting is definitely coming back. Good. There was a time <laughs> that it was sort of I don't know, again, it's their trends for whatever reason. And um, this is one that I also am a personally a big fan of. Ceramics. So traditionally, a lot of sort of female mediums were um, not, necessar not necessarily part of the fine art market. And we're seeing a big shift in that to textiles, to ceramics. And there's so many creative ways to use ceramics. And um, check out the gardener if you haven't already been. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. And then this is um, another aspect of the art world that I think we're seeing a lot more in terms of like reference to what the contemporary discourse is. Artists are always commenting on the society that we live in, whether it's in literature or film, it's also the same for the visual arts. And so there are many different voices that have traditionally not been represented in like museum institutions and were only represented in um, artist-run centers that were not as commercial. But the, but the language is changing, and I think people are buying about things that they really care about. And so Maya Fur's work is about sustainability in the fashion industry. Esma Mohamud's um, this work is in reference to Colin Kaepernick um, kneeling at the NFL. And then Florence Yee is about LGBTQ, um, her like, experience as an yeah. artist. And so I think that you know, works that speak to someone's personal history and story, and if that connects to your personal story, are, we're really seeing that in a major way because it is being acknowledged in museum institutions. Yes, and if you want to know where trends come from for your home, you start with artists. Mm -hmm. You see it all the time. You go to an art show. I remember going to London to a Saatchi Collection art show many, many years ago. And I looked at all the themes of hygiene and transparency and disease, and it translated into our home trend. Mm -hmm. No more wall-to-wall -wall carpeting, hardwood floors, stainless steel appliances, lighting like you're in, a, in an operating room. It came from a fear of disease, a need for transparency, and the artists were the first people to talk about it. Exactly. Everything goes, because they're picking up the street. Totally. They know what's going on. And they're, it, yeah. it's like and they're, they're sending it out in their art. Like, soul being poured out into yeah. their art. It's which, fantastic. Yeah. Okay, so as Linda was mentioning earlier, when you're looking at an artist's CV and you're sort of thinking like, what does this all mean? Um, there are some points that, as a curator, we're looking at to sort of gauge where an artist is at their career right now and to decipher where they might go next. So education, of course, is one that um, we always look at. Gallery representation, are they represented? Where are they represented? Which galleries? And of course, there's a very sort of nuanced system of tiers of galleries. Um, and then exhibition history, they'll always list their solo exhibitions or their group exhibitions, residency participation, there's something called artist residencies that artists participate in globally, and again, there's sort of different levels and, and formats for artist residencies, but the ones that they participate in can often sort of speak to, again, yeah. where they're at in their career, and again, public collections. Um, that we were talking about earlier. And I use this work by Tao Lewis because she is, to every sort of list of rules that we have, there's always um, exceptions to the rule. And so, you know, we can say we follow this list, but it doesn't always matter. Tao is a self-taught artist. And I worked with her about four years ago, and now she's collected by the MoMA PS1, the Hammer, um, 
she was just in a group show with Jeffrey Deitch Gallery, which is one of the biggest galleries in the world. It doesn't matter if you're a self-taught artist or where you're coming from. If you can sense that, again, artist with a capital A, believe it, because trust your instincts. And then where to buy the, the juicy bit. Um, I love buying directly from an artist. I think that is huge. Um, it is not only that boost of confidence to that artist, to sort of, it, it pays the rent. It's real to them. Okay, but you trust your eye, you trust your taste, yes. and you know how to find them. Yeah. What about the rest of us? <laughs> I think when the more you look. Oh, yeah, that's the right. Look, 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 look. That's why. <laughs> yeah. Research, education. Yes, and I think that you should really trust your instincts. Like, if you love it, don't go based on the trends. Art is about what you love and what speaks to you. It's, it's really like the purest form of communication. You know, people have been painting on cave walls for 40,000 years. It's, it's so natural, and so every different artwork is going to speak to a different person in its own unique way. So I always tell people to trust themselves, but do your research before so you also have that confidence in yourself, because it does take confidence. Um, so, yeah, just having a studio visit with an artist last week, and we were talking about, you know, collectors, and he's like, I just want people to slide into my DMs which is obviously an Instagram reference, but almost no artist is going to be angry if you reach out to them directly to say, I love their, your work. I mean, you know, just bridge that gap. They want to hear from you. That is what they're creating. So I always encourage people, and again, which is why I love the Artist Project. It's such um, a valuable way to get that face-to-face. -face. Um, online galleries like my own, ninth edition. Okay, how does that work? So I see something I like in an online gallery. It comes to me rolled up. It's not framed. It's not framed. And so I pay for it. Yes. How long can I keep it? You can keep it for two weeks. And if it's in its original packaging, of course, in its original condition, you can send it back. I totally appreciate for collectors, there's um, a certain level of faith that you have to have to buy online. And that's why I always encourage people to look in real life in person before, because the more you see in person, the more comfortable you're going to be buying online, because you're going to understand, oh, yes, it's like painting on canvas paper. Right. So yes, people can always return it. I have had no returns yet. Really? So yeah. No returns? Yeah. And so I like it, and I want to get it framed. Do you help with that? Yes. Okay. I can ship directly to a framer. So I do research for clients. But I want to see it first. You want to see it first? I want to okay. see it. So you can have it to your house, or I can ship it to the framer and you can and you see can it there. The framer. Yes. Very good. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I just did that for a client in Kelowna. Yeah. Researched the framer. She went and met. They decided on the frames. I sent the framing options that we had recommended um, to the framer so she could pull them before the client came. It was all very efficient and streamlined, mm -hmm. which is nice because framing is also sometimes kind of a burden, you know? It was scary. It's scary, yeah. and it's it scary. is a cost. Okay. Um, yes, and I would yeah. just say as a caveat, online galleries, if you see art online and there is no information about the artist or the material or the edition is over 50, forget oh. it, forget it. Don't, don't <laughs> go there, don't go there. You don't trust them. They're no. not artist-focused. No. If you're ripping off an artist, what's no. the point? So art, art galleries will often let you pay an artwork off over time and also ask for a discount. They may not always extend a discount depending on the value always of the ask artwork. For a discount. Exactly. That's just a rule of life. <laughs> yeah. You don't you ask, it. you don't get. Yeah. Um, and then art fairs. And there are a few different models of the artist project. There um, is Art Toronto, which happens in late October. Mm -hmm. And this is another way just to see artwork in person. And you can always buy directly from them. And there are art fairs that happen internationally. And that's always a really interesting reflection, too, of like what's happening in the art market on a larger scale. And then auction houses. People don't often think about artwork at auction houses um, as an accessible price point. But Waddington's has, and the other auction houses, Heffel and um, Consigner, have sales with artwork starting at $300. So take a look at them. They're bedded by an auction house. They often have research attached to them. Um, and it's it's not as well known as um, an avenue. And a lot of them have gone digital as well, so you can just scan through artworks online. And then secret acquisition sources. 
Uh, I really like these avenues because, again, grad shows, you're getting the artists. Um, and you're really, helping the school. You're helping the school. You, yeah, you're getting the artists right out of the bat. You're supporting them into the next level of their career. And they are creating the most interesting work because they're in this ex experimental environment where they just sort of have the support to do whatever their heart desires. And I think it creates some really interesting work. Um, and this is just two schools that, but there are many, many schools that you can go to. And again, charitable auctions. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, the best art at charitable auctions. You have to pay the admission ticket and you get to sort of go to like a really nice dinner or sort of like a cocktail party. But at the same time, artists have submitted work that they're incredibly proud of. It's going to a charity, but then also the prices realized are actually very accessible because they want people to enjoy themselves and donate. So I always think that there's... And there's some big names. Big names, yeah. big names. and they. Yeah, it, it's sort of like an interesting place, too. Yeah. So it's fun to also see how that group of artworks has been curated. And then I have four curatorial pillars, whether it's for a public project or my own collection. And this sort of helps guide my experience. One, of course, is the visual. If you don't love it, don't buy it. If someone tells you it's an investment piece, but you don't like it, don't do it. There's a maybe investment piece somewhere else that you do love. So you should never live with anything you don't love. And um, I would also say that if you don't fully understand why you love it, don't worry about that because the best works that sort of grow with you are the works that slightly challenge you. If it's completely comfortable right off the bat, it's, that's okay, but I would say challenge yourself. Um, two is conceptual. Again, it's very artist-led. It's why did they create it? It's sort of prompting you to ask questions and go a layer deeper. Um, who is it? What are the materials? All of sort of the, the below the surface aesthetic values. And then three, practical. You know, whether I'm curating for the lobby of a hotel or my own home where I cannot have ceramics right now. It's just not a reality. Because of your children. Um, children. Or if you have too much if you have too much light. Exactly. It's gonna be destroyed. Yes. Or if it's in your kitchen. Yes. Like hit, putting art in your kitchen's a very big trend, but you have to be careful. You have to know exactly what it can withstand. You can't be a theatrical yeah. chef. Right, all those things. It's got to be careful. So yes, always consider the practical. And um, four is the collective. How does it fit with the collective of everything else that you have? And not to be prescriptive, to be like, you have a beige work here and a gray work here. It's not like that, because your collection should be a reflection of you, and, and you are multifaceted. So don't try to collect within an aesthetic, because it's, each piece should show sort of an element of what obviously made you love it. And, but it should work with the space. You know, if you have a yellow wall, I don't know. Actually, I don't That's know. That's a good segue say. for me. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Very good. I think it really does work as a collective um, experience, whether it's with the other works in your space or your interior design. Or interior design. <laughs> Good. We're going to come back and we're going to ask Ashley questions in a minute. Which one's forward? Up? Down? Down. Okay. So now you've heard a little bit about how to get started, how to meet the artist. You can't do it too quickly. You've got to spend time. Any art that I've ever bought, I've had an advisor help me buy because I was too scared to do it on my own. That's the truth. And too busy to do all those things you're talking about. But now, now I'm starting to do what you're talking about and I'm loving it. And I was on the board of the AGO for many, many years, and I still never understood how to buy young emerging artists. But now I'm learning. So I want to talk to you about choosing the right art for your room. So I'm going to quickly go through a lot of pictures. So I'm going to go fast, starting with my own house. So this, to me, is interesting because I feel that when you're collecting, you should buy pieces that speak to each other and never worry about the cost. I have some expensive things, and I have something very inexpensive, which is my most recent purchase that Diana helped me buy that I love. So, you know, you recognize the mobile, it's Calder, that's expensive. And that is a, um, a um, Ad Adolf Gottlieb painting in the middle. And then, down there, that yellow piece is a Joy Walker that Diana just helped me buy. And I love it. It was inexpensive, young artist, and I love the way that they 
speak to each other. So that's important. I go down, right? There's the Joy Walker up close. It's kind of like it's paper folded and ripped down and then framed under glass. It's fantastic. These are two pieces that she bought me uh, by Kristen Morin from my front hall. And I have black walls. So it allowed me to put something that popped and it didn't need to be framed. So let's think about the wall it's going on, think about the environment it's in, whether people can get up close to look at it, and what kind of statement you want to make visually. This is my kitchen. I don't know who the artist is. I wish I did. I bought it a long time ago. These are works on paper. They're under plastic, so they can be in a kitchen. And I wanted no color. I wanted that it tonal to fit in with the, the dark furniture that I had. I'm afraid I buy it emotionally, whether I like it, I, I listen to whether I think the artist is going somewhere, but it's got to look good with the room. Yeah. This is my um, TV room, and this is one of my favorite artists, which is why I was glad you said that figurative and portraiture and, uh, and paintings are coming back. This is Tony Sherman, and I collect his work. This is Barbara Streisand when she was in love with Pierre Elliott Trudeau, and they almost got married, remember? And she, there she is, all bundled up in fur because they were in Ottawa in the winter. And like, they were really in love. And he and Tony did this painting of her at that time. And I love the way it focuses your eye and, and makes you want to go into the room. And oh, it's a magical piece. Yeah. This is my bathroom. And in the bathroom, I have um, a little nude, and I don't know who it's by. It's, I just picked it up somewhere a long time ago. But in the, in the bath area, I have two pieces that you can't really see by Amona Hartoum, and they are pubic hair under glass. And they're perfect in the bathroom because they can get wet. <laughs> and I like, I like the statement, right? And then that's a bust. I guess it's, I got it in Thailand. I think it's Chinese. But I like that marriage. I like that. And it's on a, uh, on a clear plastic um, stand. And I like the blind, which is a Kelly Wurstler, a modern, um, a modern interior designer who does fabric design. And I like her, that, that play. Yeah. Now, this is uh, Kelvin Brown's condo. And Kelvin is the uh, director of the Gardner Museum. And he has a fabulous eye. And this drawing by Francis Grafton is in a very tiny room. But it expands the space. It, you walk in and you're just overtaken by this huge, big picture. And you don't feel how small the space is. So sometimes, break all the rules about scale. If the room is small, go big. And here's another example of oversize and color. A lot of our readers want to put color into their rooms. They don't know how. They're scared. They don't want to paint their walls. They want white walls little hits of color in furniture, but that's about all they're going to commit to until they find a great piece of art that just does it. I also love this because it speaks to how each room can have its own distinct yes. personality. Dining room, you can go really bold. Yes. Your bedroom, maybe you don't want yes, as bold. Yes, because you're not spending so much time in the dining room. Mm -hmm. But notice how this is framed. I mean, I love that. The artist may not have framed it that way. But somebody had a really good eye and understood the importance of the outline, the yellow outline. Now, this is the last home of my good friend, Bonnie Brooks. And she has an amazing art collection. And she used to run HBC. You probably heard her on the radio. And she bought most of her art in Hong Kong when she was there running Lane Crawford. And over the years, I've done different houses for her. And we always do her rooms around her art. And this is about color. This is a palette of soft gray and mauve and charcoal. And I don't know who that artist is. And it's just it's beautiful. The whole house is done that way. This is her dining room. This is artist is Yu Chen. And she has a lot of Yu Chen's work. And it just floats. And look how low it's, 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 um, it's hung. And it's a dining room. So you can kind of, I couldn't live with that in my bedroom. Dining room, it works. This is another Tony Sherman. And it's in a, a, a reader's home, some, or someone whose home we um, published. But again, I feel like the portrait takes over and helps you get past what's a lot going on in that room. But it focuses you. It just cuts through like a bullseye. 
Again, this is Bonnie with her Yu Chen in her, this is her bedroom. It's pink, the whole room, all her accessories are pink. Her bedding was pink in that house. This is her library. And here, there was so much going on with the moldings that we went for something under glass because of the light, and we wanted it light and airy, and it's a photographic work by Aaron Worm. Dining room. This is a very small room, and we were worried about staring at a blank wall, and anything we put there was going to feel too enclosed. But this work by Kiri Scarbecca, it, 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 it has perspective, so it makes you feel like you're looking out a window and it really does expand the space. After hanging that, we went and got the balls. We picked the balls in the chandelier to bring out the colors in the, in the art. So it wasn't an accident. <laughs> yeah. Foyer, she really loves you, Chen. Yeah. Okay, this was recent. This is the home of Pamela Meredith, who's a great collector. And this work is by Colleen Heslin. And I love that this was selected for its graphic quality, for it, for the design, but also for the texture of how it plays off the wood walls. It's fantastic. Now, let's talk about gallery walls. Yes. Gallery walls is a great way to get started because you can just buy a few things, have them framed so they're sympathetic with each other, put them together and make a big statement. Any tips for how to do a gallery wall? How to start? How to start a gallery wall? Again, I think buying on paper is a really great way to start because um, you can frame it. It sort of works with the other elements, but build out by including a diverse um, range of mediums. So start with paper. It's a little bit either easier to move around, but then add in a photograph or a painting. So again, it's mixed media. Yeah, you and can keep moving things, right? You just keep moving things. And again, smaller works, just starting with a gallery wall. If it starts to not work with other elements or other artworks that you're collecting, you can move it into another space. And yeah. so I think that the versatility of that is really great. And what I really like about this um, gallery wall too is that not all of the frames are the exact same. Right. So they're complementary, yes. but they're not identical. And there's no rule. And there you are no rules. You just have to work at it. And you can't start on the wall because you'll end up with a million holes. It does not work. I mean, you have to be really, really good to use the tape measure and the level. I start on the floor. I map out my wall on the floor. I put down craft paper. I move everything around for a long time, and then I start drawing. I mean, I make a pattern, basically. And that's, I don't know, how, the other way takes a professional. Agreed. Agree. Yeah. You can either hire a professional yeah, art that's installer, also a good way to do it. which is a good yeah. way to do it. They're, they're definitely worth it, but quite pricey. So yeah. I think going on the floor yeah, and it, it actually does organizing work. it works really well. Here's another example of a gallery wall on one side of a window. So it doesn't have to be the whole wall, and it doesn't even have to be symmetrical. This is a, a country house in upstate New York, and it belongs to the director of a fashion brand, and I can't remember which one it is. Uh, it'll come to me. This is Montana Burnett, a young, very talented designer, and her trick is to paint one wall black and then hang the works. The rest of the room is not black. It's very grounding. Yes, I really like adding another color under a gallery wall, too, because even if all of the works do not necessarily have a theme, yeah. that sort of undertone. And it's something that we're seeing a lot too in a museums, yeah. is adding these sort of like mauves or light blues or blacks. Yeah. And so it sort of adds this no another yeah. dimension to the collection of works. Yes. This is, um, a, this is a collection by um, Douglas Copeland. And this is also in Bonnie's house. But we did the molding after she bought this grouping so that it would frame it and give it some dimension. It's beautiful. I love it. It's all the wigs. It's an ode to Andy Warhol, so they're all wigs placed in the center, which I think is really funny and great. And it, yeah, I, I and really she like bought it at, she bought it at a cherry auction. Really? Yes. OK, there see? There you go. Yes. This is um, Amelia Samard in Montreal. And what's cool about this is it's off her kitchen. She didn't go black because she has all stainless steel appliances. And she told me her intention was to carry the gray onto the wall so that her gallery wall would pop and still work with the stainless steel appliances. It's pretty great. Yeah, it's 
nice continuity. Another one by Colette van der Pellert, who's a Toronto designer. And she's covered the entire wall. It's beautiful. Now this is interesting. This is Garo Kedigan. He's a he works in Montreal and New York. He's an interior designer, super talented. He paints his walls with chalkboard paint for himself and his clients. And then he uses chalk and he draws the outlines. And if you lean up against the wall, it comes off on your clothes. He doesn't seal it on purpose because you know he gets tired of it and he changes it. And you can actually hire artists to come in and do it, but he does it. I think it's fantastic. I also really like leaning in artwork too. Yes. I think also, if you are hesitating on where to put an artwork, lean it. Yes. So many curators that yes. I know that I work with spend, if they've moved into a new yes. house or have a new piece, they'll lean it for like three to six months and then hang it. Because sometimes I lean it forever. Exactly. I yeah. just, I'm, I, either I'm lazy or I like the flexibility. I like the flexibility yeah. and the height difference yes. that you can sort of get But then that. you finally hire someone to come in and hang everything and it looks so good. And you think, why didn't I do this before? I like this one by Richard Ouellette, a Montreal designer, because he just shows you that it doesn't have to be symmetrical. That's the TV on the left, and it could have had a screensaver on it, a piece of art, right? Just doesn't. And then on, off center on the fireplace, and then on the right over a commode. And I like the balance. I think it's great. Nothing wrong with the TV in the living room off to the side. Doesn't have to be over the fireplace. Same thing in a bathroom. And the frame, of course, picks up on the copper tub. Another bathroom. This is, uh, I don't know, this is a vintage portrait. Okay, this is also by Richard Ouellet and Maxime Vandel. This is a kitchen. Two pieces on either side of the hood. Wow, I mean, that's fantastic. As long as they're under glass, it's fine, right? And they're practical. leaning. But I think that they must be hooked. They're yes, hooked. yeah, they're yeah. probably secured on the back. I think, oh yeah. Uh, this is in a, in a foyer, and you can get up close to it and see how great it is. This is in Roz Ivy's apartment, and her, this artist, Kazu Nakamura, was chosen to go with these vintage chairs from First Dibs. It's a color story. This is her kitchen. This artist is uh, Denise Tomasas, hung really low at the breakfast area. This is Bonnie's dining room. On the other side, there are the balls up there, right? And this is Roz's foyer. This is a Bratinsky. And she chose to put it there because you can stand this far away from it. You can get up right close. It's fantastic. That's like a mine shaft somewhere. It's like a, it's a dig. And it looks like a perfect seashell. But it's nature. I love that. I think that might be it. Yeah, that's the end of that. Anyway, these are some examples of people who chose work for their rooms for lots of reasons besides loving the art. Mm -hmm. yes. Right? Okay, so a couple questions before we let you ask your questions. Okay. If you could own one piece of art, what would it be? With no budget. No budget. I love El and Atsui. Um, he's an artist that uses um, refuse uh, to create these beautiful tapestries. And you said no budget, why? Oh, because he is, his works are like millions and millions, millions of dollars. Okay. All right. so, what, about a, what about a budget piece? Um, a budget piese? Oh, I... I who, who, are you who are you loving right now? Uh, Stephanie here, who I included on one of the slides with the little hands over the sculptural. She's yeah. someone that I'm really excited about. Um, she actually has a show opening up at Ben Kaka Gallery. Uh, at the beginning of March, and she, yes, I love her work. Oh my God, that's such a hard question. Well, I, it's what we all want to know. Yes, um, you know? I, I really love her sculptural works, and so I really love Tao Lewis. Um, I, Stephen Beckley is someone that I have collected, and I really love what he's doing with light and transparencies. Works that really interest me tend to have a sculptural element, um, so, not necessarily suitable for my current lifestyle. Um, Julia Dalt, did I say that? Um, I'm trying to think. Sarah Kale has a beautiful show on right now at Clint Ronish and was featured in one of the recent episodes of House and Home. Uh, Olafur Eliasson is an artist I love. 
Uh, is there somebody here we should go look at because we can't miss them? I haven't walked the show yet. Oh, well, Alison Postma is an artist from Ninth Editions, and she has a booth over in the Emerging Artist section. Kendra Yee is an artist I've worked with, and then I, I don't know, there are so many artists that I was just scanning through, but I don't know many of these artists personally, so I couldn't say. But um, I think artists are using really interesting materials here, too. I'm looking at cutouts and ceramics and sort of light boxes. I think there's so much. Can we ask? I have one question before you, you get to ask. What about money? Tell me, what is, what is an amount of money that a person starting out should save to start buying their first pieces? I would say to really buy an artwork is minimum fifteen hundred dollars, including the frame. It's not bad. No, including or excluding frame. Including, the, including frame. the frame. Yeah. Okay. And what about buying for investment? Can you buy something for five thousand dollars and see it go woof? I think so. Yes. If you buy intelligently, like with a lot of sort of. Again, that research. And then maybe do you need an art advisor? An art, art advisor is really going to help I had an art you. advisor who was a dear friend, and he died two years ago. His name was Tom Bjarnason. He was fantastic. And he helped me buy when I was first starting out. And I can tell you, he, I mean, he, he introduced me to things that were $5,000, and then he resold them for me for 10 times as much in only a few years. Yes. If you get the right art advisor, you can do very well. Absolutely, because they really have their finger on the pulse and they yeah. know who's working, who's just been represented by a gallery or who's just gone from sort of like the more emerging gallery to the mid-career gallery. And so again, there's just all these sort of levels. Yeah. And by, by participating in the art market, you get to yeah. see how all of the elements are connected. Yeah, so it's all possible. Um, and <laughs> with an art advisor too, they've done all that due diligence for you. And so yeah. they can be a really valuable asset. You have to be prepared for it not to in increase, but usually it will hold its value if yes. it's a good artist. Exactly. Yeah. And so buy what you love with the hope that it will be an investment. If it doesn't, you still love it, but it yeah. could very much be, be. Um, an investment that does increase and appreciate over time. Okay. We have time for some questions. There's a mic here. Any questions for Ashley or me? No? Oh, you must have some. Well, then I'm going to keep asking. How much time do we have? Do we have a question over here? Five or ten minutes? Okay. Okay. Hmm. Oh. Okay, hi. And this is really just a simple question. We had a great talk about kind of what to do first. I'm curious to say, but what happens with the second? It's that you, you gear up and it's about buying and investing in that first piece and then it's like, okay, I want to continue along this line. What? Okay, next? do you think, for example, are you, do you think people should collect one artist? Should they collect things that are sympathetic to each other? Should they collect different mediums? Like, is there, are there any rules about what's next? That's a good question. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. I think that there are, no, there are no rules, but I think that by creating um, or buying works from different artists in different mediums create more of an interesting collection. If you have only photography, because you absolutely love photography, that's one thing, but if, if you are buying a work that's photography that then has sort of like a, a reference to a painting, there's always going to be a tie because you are the tie and what you are interested in does connect the works but I think the most interesting collections have a real mix of mediums and themes um, you know whether it's again figurative painting to sculpture to whatever everything sort of has its form and and it'll keep you more interested in the works as well and I don't think that I think there is a lot of pressure on the first work thinking like this has to define me and my collecting process but once you sort of start to add works to that collection or collection you sort of get to see how they do have a complementary sort of relationship and that again it is like everyone is so multifaceted but it's sort of speaking to all of your different sides 
I had a mold remediator come to my house and say that I had a really quirky collection. And I thought that that was really funny and totally unexpected. But again, it it's about the life that my husband and I have and, you know, our sort of varying interests. And so it should speak to you and if you can play with it. And that second piece is with the first piece in mind. It's, it's, um, that's interesting what you just said. So when you meet someone, should you ask to see their art collection? <laughs> yeah. Sort of soon? <laughs> because like, what if it's awful? What if you have opposite taste? Then what? Oh, um, you just don't ever hang out at their house. Okay. <laughs> All right. I mean, it must be an issue with some couples. Absolutely. When, when I first start, started dating my husband, he had two things that quickly went to the basement uh -huh. yeah. and we moved in together. So it happens. And again, like building a collection with a person and your partner is a journey because yeah. I might love something and he hates it. And so that's also another thing to navigate. Yeah. And it's kind of funny when you start to cohabitate yeah. and build your life together. But again, collecting is an evolution. Yeah. It, it'll never stop because it's so fun once you get into it. That's my other thing. You'll love it. Um, and as a designer, I can tell you that the, one of the biggest issues we see when we go into homes, people buy art that's too small, they're always worried about it being too big, so they buy it too small, it's terribly framed, if they just would get it reframed, it would have a hope of being terrific, right? It just doesn't hold the wall, and if you have a bunch of bad stuff that's not great, put it all together on a gallery wall, get it reframed, and you know, it can be something. Absolutely, and a good framer is your best Amazing. friend. I work you with want to recommend few framers. A uh, yes, uh, Fernanda at a cow framing on Queen West, and Anna Oster at Toronto Image Works. I love them. Like oh, they make my down. life so much better because down. they are just brilliant. They're visionaries. They're yeah. just creative, and I yeah. use um, both of them for different types of projects and um, a good frame can make your artwork sing. Yeah. And again, if you have these artworks, and I have And there's Mitch. Do you know Mitch? Yes. Uh, at, he's at the interior. Yeah, he's good. Yeah. And the Gilder. Okay, yeah. yes, I've never used him, but I hear Very wonderful good. things. Yeah, the Gilder. Any other questions? Okay, framing budget. Framing budget, frames are expensive, but again, always worth the investment. I would say a good frame is like $400 for right. a smaller work. It, it feels crazy, but it is so worth it. And you should always use the right kind of glass. Yes, to UV protect your protected glass, yeah. um, non-reflective. It will make your artwork pop. Artwork behind regular glass gets sort of foggy, you don't ever get the right lighting for it. it. It's just sort of a big barrier to actually what is behind it. And so really quality glass. But don't, don't am I assuming right that young artists can't afford big framing budgets? So what you buy sometimes is not the best frame? Yes. Or not the best glass? So you have to get it redone. Yes, yeah. yes. I would say if something is behind um, foggy glass and not in a great frame, have it reframed. It does sort of hurt at the beginning, but it is so worth it um, because you're going to enjoy it so much more. So, like, why did you buy it if you know it's not going to be presented on its best foot? Um, but again, yeah, it's always better to invest in the art and then upgrade to a better frame too. If that's sort of the balance. I've learned a lot from you. <laughs> Thank you. I have learned a lot from you. Thank you for coming today. I'm going to walk the show.